So Coach Danowski, thank you so much for, for joining me. I, I'm Jesse Cook for Citrus TV, and it, it really means a lot that you, you're taking the time today. Oh, Jesse, man, it's a pleasure. It's, it's, uh, we don't get to do this too often, so uh, we're delighted to, uh, delighted to do it. Thank you. Well, so let's just jump right in. Uh, tomorrow, you've got probably one of the more notable matchups of the season, just get, judging by how the last couple of years have gone with Syracuse, but it's your first time going up against Gary Gate. And two, both of you are legendary lacrosse names. Gary Moore for playing, you for the the most the winningest coaching record in college lacrosse history. Can you talk about your mindset going up against him? Yeah, you know, I don't really think about it that way. Um, you know, I'm just glad he's not suiting up, you know, because I know that, uh, you know, we played them when, during my days at Hofstra. And, well, we could never come close uh, to the Orange in those days. So I'm glad he's wearing a suit on the sideline and he's not, uh, he doesn't wear a uniform. Uh, that's probably my, my, my first reaction. Um, but uh, delighted that he's joining the college ranks. Uh, but I would be remiss if I didn't uh, give a shout out to John Desco, uh, you know, Miss John, um, terrific man, you know, great for our sport, great for the game, um, was a Syracuse man, is up, you know, coached his alma mater. And, you know, that's such a, a joy to be able to do that. Um, and, um, and certainly, you know, we'll miss him on the sideline and miss that competition part. Yeah, I, do, I, I have to say, as delighted as I am to be able to cover this team this season, uh, I wasn't on the beat last year, so I never got to cover any of John Desco and his incredible coaching record. So as happy as I am to be covering Coach Gate and everyone he comes up against. It is a little bit of a sore spot for me that I never got to do anything for Coach Desco. But all that aside, you know, you mentioned Gary Gate wearing a suit on the sideline. I was at Johns Hopkins a couple of weeks ago, and uh, there were two things that I noticed from that game that really struck me. One, lacrosse turf is impossible to get out of a suit. It's been two weeks, and I still have, I'm still finding green flecks on my jacket. But two, uh, Syracuse has had a lot of trouble breaking free from behind the cage and creating room on offense as a team that's up there in goal scored per game. Can you talk about how you're looking to defend against that? Well, I think one of the things that, that happens in any transition, um, you know, there's a cultural transition um, when you have a new staff, uh, the new staff. Um, again, I remember, you know, my first year at Duke that, you know, there's part of you that doesn't really want to mess with what worked before. And as part of you that wants to implement some new things, you know, things that you're, you're comfortable teaching. And then they're, they're probably, they're transitioning, you know, in, from this one space to another. Um, and certainly this could be the week that they break out. This could be the week they play the best game of the season. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, there is this curve, you know, learning curve. The coaches are learning about their players. Their players are learning about their coaches. And, um, and I think that that's, you know, that's probably and without knowing, I don't talk to anybody at Syracuse. So without knowing, but just as an observer, that, that probably is part of it. You know, for us, um, you know, we need to defend the off ball, um, the movement in front of the goal. Um, you know, we need to, to be aware uh, of, of where, you know, people are inside. Um, you know, they cut in and out of the crease. Um, very slick lacrosse players couple of incredibly uh, dynamic players in Curry and Dorkovic, but um, in Dorkovic, but, but they're all dangerous, you know, because they all play at Syracuse. So that makes them all dangerous. Now you, you talked about finding chemistry with your team, especially as a new coach, you've had a lot of your team for more than this season. Dyson Williams, Brennan O'Neill, both there last year, Mike Adler is a grad student. How has that connection developed over the years as opposed to when they were first at your program? Well, I think last year for all of us, you know, who, who got a chance to coach last year and not all of us did, you know, we have to remember all the constraints that were placed on our students. Um, you know, here at Duke, I can, I can say that, you know, not one of our students had a roommate. You know, everybody had a single room. Um, when we went on the road, there were no roommates. Uh, we actually flew to two games last year where we just flew the day of the game, played, and came home because we didn't want to mess with the COVID. It wasn't so much, well, it was a little bit of, you know, guys getting COVID, but it was also the, you know, that if anybody was exposed, then it was 14 days as opposed to 10 days if you tested positive. So 
you know, it, it was a, in the fall, there was no locker room. So it was almost impossible, not impossible, but it was very difficult to build uh, a, a team dynamic off the field because you could play a game on a Thursday night, win a game, and then you couldn't go out afterwards. And let's face it, you know, I mean, athletes like to celebrate and like to celebrate a victory or commiserate a loss. And, you know, they weren't allowed to do that last year. And, and so, you know, it was a very strange, unique year. Um, we were certainly grateful that we got to play. Now, this year is different. You know, this year, you know, guys, you know, from the start, we've been in the weight room together. Um, we've just been able to take off our masks in the last three weeks in the weight room. You know, we, we're still wearing them in the classroom, but um, it, it's, uh, you know, it's better. Uh, you know, better socialization, better, um, you know, in the training room, in the locker room, in the weight room, off the field. And that helps, you know, in building that team chemistry on the field. So now that they're all together, so you, you touched on it a, a lot there, that there is this team mentality and team chemistry. So how important does that become, especially when you walk in on the road into a stadium like the Carrier Dome? Well, you know, last week, you know, we played in um, we played at DC United Stadium, you know, which is not not as big as the Carrier Dome, but but big, you know, 20,000, 20,000 seats or whatever it was. And, you know, um, a wall our crowd was not as impressive as the Virginia Maryland game. Um, it still was a feel of a big time event, you know, um, and, um, you know, we had played up on Long Island at a high school, you know, small facility, but the place was packed. And there was standing room only and people were standing on the side and, you know, yelling and screaming. And, and so we've been in these different environments and, and that's part of the fun. Part of the fun are all these unique venues and all these memories that you're going to have uh, and all the different challenges that it brings. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's one team versus the other, regardless of the size of the stands and regardless of the field, whether it's grass or turf or, you know, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. And the guys have to learn that. Um, and the only way by learning how to do that is by being in those environments and being in those situations. You've been a part of, of lacrosse culture for nearly your entire life. I'm one of the legendary Rutgers players. So with all that experience, you're just talking about, you know, great venues they've been able to play at and all those road experiences. You now we're talking about Syracuse, but do you have a favorite that comes to mind over all those years? You know, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, playing in, 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 in the big stadiums are always cool. You know, we've played, you know, in Denver and we've played in, you know, we played at MetLife. We played Syracuse twice at MetLife, which was, you know, uh, an incredible experience because I'm a big giant fan. So, you know, playing there is, is cool. We played some now soccer stadiums in Philadelphia and now in D.C., which have been great. But I, I just love the on-campus uh, you know, uh, Clockner, Virginia, and, um, you know, and places like that, that are just, um, you know, where people come out and, and they cheer for the home team and, and the games are exciting and fun. And, um, you know, that's, that's just part of the Saturday afternoon, you know, college experience that, uh, you know, that I grew up with. I don't know how I feel about you being a Giants fan. I'm a Patriots fan. So All right. well, you guys well, got a couple on us. Yeah, you know, the blood runs, it runs deep, so I, I can't help myself. Well, I'll take the six Super Bowls, but All right. now I, I recently got to travel, as I said, to Johns Hopkins, and that was my first road experience as, as a reporter. So going to, to Baltimore and seeing all that culture that's so adverse to Syracuse was really an interesting experience. But another thing that came with it was Dave Petromala returning home. So Syracuse with Petromala, with Gate, with TD Ireland has a really new coaching staff, one that you haven't, you've come up against Petromala a few times, but not as a defensive coordinator. How does that new coaching staff play into your game plan? Uh, not at all, really. You know, for us, this is game 12. And, and, and for us, you know, you get to a point in the season, and I'm sure a lot of coaches feel this way, it's about your team. You know, it's about execution. Uh, you know, last week we played Towson, and uh, the first 30 minutes we scored two goals. And then the first minute and 40 seconds of the second half, we scored three. I can't explain it. <laughs> you know, it's not like we said at halftime, all right, hey, listen, in the first minute 40, we're going to score three goals, all right? That's, that's the plan. Now let's go out and do it. You know, we, we take no credit for that. You know, that's all about the players. So, 
I, I think that, um, you know, you get to a certain point, there's not a lot different you're going to see. Teams are going to slide. You know, they're going to make somebody, they're going to take away your strong hand. You're going to make a, a certain player a lefty or a righty. You're going to slide to them or you're not. You're going to slide from inside or you're going to slide adjacent. You know, it's, you're going to play some zone. You might, you know, we might see some zone on Saturday. Um, and so we've seen it all already. And it's, it's a matter of, you know, communication, execution. And while, you know, um, while these games seem bigger in that respect, um, a, a, a big part of the ACC games are the game is played uh, simpler. You know, that at this point in the year, teams are kind of, they, they, they are who they're going to be. And so it's just a matter of they can execute their stuff better than you execute your stuff. Well, speaking of executing better, I mean, I know that's how you win games, but Syracuse this past season took one of their top midfielders in Tucker Dordovic and moved him up to attack. Now, he's been very successful up there, fourth in the nation in goals per game, but that leaves a little wanting for the Orange in the midfield. So how, how has that changed in your mind? with one of Syracuse's top players moving up? How, how is it a, between the restraining lines? Well, I think what happens is that, you know, the, again, the transition to a new offense, the transition if you're a younger player, and they've lost some really talented kids from last year. You know, if, if you're, it, it, there is this transition, even though, you know, kids come, um, in, you know, with, with great acclaim from high school or club lacrosse or wherever they come from, there is an adjustment. There's an adjustment to Division One. There's adjustment to ACC play, and you know, moving your best player to attack just makes sense. Um, you, you know, when you're on the sideline as a coach, do you want to turn around and see your best player standing behind you, waiting his turn to run at midfield, or do you want to see him on the field all the time? And there's a certain, you know, when his teammates look out on the field and they see him out there. There's a certain calmness that that brings that all, you know, his teammates go, it's going to be okay. You know, it's going to be all right. And every team is always searching for that guy, you know, that, that when you look on the, whether it's on offense or defense, it's the goalie, it's the draw man, you know, you're looking to say, he's going to calm everybody down. It's, it's going to be okay. And, and I think that and he certainly um, in this first half of the season, he's certainly doing a, a phenomenal job in that role. So that brings up the, the topic of depth. Now, Syracuse, la th this season, they, most of their goals are coming from three players in Dordovic, Brennan Curry, and Owen Siebold. After them, there's not a whole lot of action. Maybe you'll see Mikey Berkman pot one, one early on. But besides that, it's a very front-heavy team. How do you look to, to play it? How do you look to exploit that? You know, again, for us, it's, you know, you've got to – You've got to defend the entire team. Um, and the reason I say that is because they're all capable. You know, they're all, um, you know, we have a saying here. Sometimes when kids will say, um, you know, they don't have confidence and, and, you know, we'll look at them and say, you know, we recruited you to play here. You know, we believe in you. You know, we, of all the people out there, you know, we chose you. Well, it's the same thing on that side. You know, Syracuse chose them and they're all very capable, you know, but for whatever reason, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, you know, academic overload, family issues, uh, you, you know, uh, team dynamic, new coach, trying to fit in, trying to feel it. You know, there's a there's a hundred different reasons, you know, why somebody may not be playing to their potential. But the thing that that really scares you about playing Syracuse is apps. They, these guys are all dangerous and they're all capable. And this could be their day. All of a sudden, one of those guys is going to score three or four goals. And, um, and you heard it here first that I wouldn't be surprised. So well, with, with that in mind, that there's going to be a lot of scoring on both sides. Let's take a look back at last year's game, where, again, a very high-scoring game, 15-14 the final. And there were times when both sides looked like they might be out of it and came all the way back. But you're looking at a roster that had Stephen Rafis, Jamie Tremboli and Drake Porter, while the Duke side had Brendan O'Neill, Dyson Williams, and Mike Adler. This season, it's Brendan Curry, Tucker Dordovic, Owen Siebold for Syracuse, 
but still Brennan O'Neill, Mike Adler, and Dyson Williams for the Blue Devils. How does how does that experience play in, and how do you see this changing from last year? You know, um, the last three times that we played Syracuse, it's been a one goal game. Uh, you know, the last time we were up in Syracuse, we played outdoors, and and uh, it was nine eight, I think, uh, overtime, and nobody expected it to be nine eight. You know, to play the game in single digits. Uh, it was a beautiful, you know, beautiful uh, same time of year, spring day. Um, wasn't that cold outdoors? It, and it was a great crowd. <clears throat> and it was really, but it was a very low scoring game. In fact, Syracuse, I think, had two goals at halftime. You know, last year um, it was 12 7 at half, and Syracuse down by five. And, and you know, of course, they have a lot of pride and they're going to keep playing. And, and so, um, I, you know, I would expect nothing less than. Uh, you know, this kind of back and forth and, and high, you know, high level action. Um, you know, the hope is that our guys are learning from their experiences. They're learning from, you know, playing with, you know, uh, for Brendan O'Neill, for playing with Sean Lawley and Joe Robertson. Um, you know, Brendan is a sophomore. He's an incredibly humble young man. He doesn't want to be perceived as, you know, we don't run anything through him. But he's able to, you know, he's able to engage and initiate on his own. Um, and um, and so, you know, some people think that, you know, geez, you know, he gets 10 shots a game. and That's a lot. And we tell him, hey, listen, man, you know, shoot to get hot, shoot to stay hot. Don't you know, don't worry about us. You know, we'll tell you when you're shooting too much. And and Mike Adler, you hope he's seeing the ball well. But good goaltending is usually a function of really good team defense in front of the goalie. Um, you know, goalies can't make every save and, and, you know, all you gotta do is make the next one. And that, that's always, that's kind of our mantra. So last stretch of the season with Mike Adler and Nick, can you just talk about your relationship with him over the last five years now? Yeah, we, have, we went, actually went out to dinner last night. Um, uh, went out to dinner with, uh, with the captains and, and, uh, you know, he's just a really interesting guy. You know, he's, he's completing the MBA program. It's an accelerated MBA. He got his master's last year uh, from Duke, you know, in the Fuqua School of Business. And this year he's getting his MBA. So, you know, he's going to leave college with three degrees, uh, you know, which is, you know, he's, he's played lacrosse for six, well, I guess five years. And, and um, you know, he's, he's played lacrosse. He's three degrees. He's, gonna, he's got a job out in Santa Monica, California, you know, that he'll leave uh, when he leaves here. He'll head out there. Um, he said his salary, he's making more than he's believes he's worthy of, which, uh, I think is an expression of his humility, you know, and what, you know, what he believes that he, he brings to the table, but he is a, you know, he, he loves the position. He loves to play. He loves to jump in the goal. He loves to jump in the goal when the offense is doing shooting drills, which I kind of cringe a little bit because I do believe you do get to a point where. That's enough. You know, we don't want you to see too many shots. You know, I think, um, I, I guess, it, you know, the term probably was devised in World War I where soldiers would come home shell-shocked. You know, we don't need the goalie to be shell-shocked. You know, we don't need him to see way too many shots. And uh, But he loves to jump in the cage, and, and the hope is that, you know, the defense is playing well in front of him. And so Syracuse – is a team that's had a lot of trouble creating space in front of the net and finding lanes in which to shoot. So with Mike Adler being who he is and with the defense being able to, to step up, what's one key in your mind for blocking Syracuse's shots? I think the, the biggest thing for us is to be able to close out effectively. Um, we've got to be able to defend inside when we slide and, um, and, and then once we recover, to be able to, you know, um, in basketball would be close out. Same thing in lacrosse. It's closing up, but closing out to the head of the stick. Closing out so, you know, we can maybe block a couple of shots with our sticks or, or just, ha you know, have the shooters just not take that shot because we close out well. Um, but you want your, you know, you want your shooters, uh, you know, on, on up when we play defense, you want your shooters to take low angle shots. You want them to take outside shots and you want them to take shots under pressure. Uh, and that's, that's the, that's always the case week after week. Now, earlier you mentioned Towson. Hey, you guys had a huge second half push, especially 
right after that opening draw. Syracuse, same deal against Stony Brook, was 5-5 up until halftime, and then they came out and scored nine goals in the second half. That takes us even back to the last few Syracuse-Duke games, where Syracuse has been stronger in the second half than in the first. What do you have to do to get that Towson magic going again and just be raring to go right from the second half draw? I think two things happen to most athletes and most teams. You know, it was the same thing, you know, two weeks ago, we're playing um, Loyola and we're down 10-2 at half. And I said to the team at halftime, it, they will not beat us 20-4. to four. You know, it's not going to be 10-2 in the second half. Teams, it's not that they want to take their foot off the gas, but you come out after halftime and you think it's going to be as easy as it was. And, for, you know, and usually we have something to do with the fact that it's 10-2. You know, that we're not playing as well, that they might, you know, be on fire. It's hard to be on fire for a full game. Sure. And second half, we, you know, second half, it goes eight to us. So, you know, to a team that we just gave up 10 goals, now we give up two goals in the second half. You know, again, how does that happen? I'm not sure. You know, and we need to figure out how to play evenly and consistently for 60 minutes which, you know, we really haven't figured that out yet. Now, Coach, I just have a couple more questions. Uh, first, is one key to win the game against Syracuse, what is it? For us, it's fundamentals. You know, we have to got to be fundamentally sound all over the field. Offensively, um, not trying to hit home runs, just trying to make singles, make that easy pass, uh, you know, chase ground balls. You don't have to pick them up, but you got to chase them. Defensively, we have to have good team position. We've got to be able to help each other, and we've got to be able to win battles one on one. You know, so you win battles. If you can't win battles, you got to be able to help each other. And then, you know, we got to clear the ball smartly. And uh, sometimes we we get a little hurry, we get a little anxious clearing the ball. We got to get a little better with that. Well, one last question. You spend the weekend in Syracuse. I've been here two years. I still can't find what to do for fun around here. What does what, what what your team do during the Syracuse weekend? Well, I'll tell you what. For us, um, you know, we, we work hard at actually raising money. So we, um, we raise enough money so we can charter, you know, to the game. And so we'll, we won't, we'll practice here tonight. Um, we won't get up to Syracuse until like 930 at night. Um, we'll have a meeting, go to bed, get up have breakfast, head over to the field, play the game, 3.30 flight home, and we'll be home and ready in time for that 9.30 tip-off, uh, Duke versus uh, Arkansas, you know, tomorrow night. So, um, you know, it's a quick turnaround, but it doesn't, uh, uh, to me, sometimes when you stay in a hotel and you spend too much time in an area, guys focus all day. They obsess about their game, the game they obsess about playing. You know, we just want to, kind of take that away from them they can go they don't have to miss class today regular practice time let's you know let's get up there and, and let's play and have some fun well coach thank you so much for talking with me and I'm it's actually a good coincidence that you didn't talk with one of our other lacrosse beat reporters because he's an Arkansas fan so it would have been one, right. one interesting interview with that looming tomorrow night so good luck tomorrow and I, I might be rooting for you guys just a little bit in the NC, in the NCAA tournament, even though Syracuse and Duke have that rivalry. You've earned – basketball team has earned this. But good luck tomorrow. Thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you. we got to support our fellow conference members, right? Go ACC. Thank you so much, Coach.